Hey there, I'm estate planning attorney Paul Rabelais, and in this video, I'm going to explain in about 20 minutes estate planning from start to finish. So what prompted this video was I gave a presentation today. I went to a credit union. They asked me to come speak to all of their vice presidents and above, and I did, and I sat in the big conference room with all the vice presidents, and I had 30 minutes, and I said, guys, for 20 minutes, I'm going to tell you as much as I can about estate planning. I'm going to throw in some examples. I'm going to use a hypothetical couple. And then we'll have some time for some questions. That'll wrap up our 30 minutes. So here's what I told them. I said, guys, I'm going to tell you a lot about estate planning. We're going to go chronologically. I'm going to use a hypothetical hypothetical example. I may even talk about some examples uh, that may affect your credit union here. So I said, guys, here's the deal. Let's take a hypothetical couple. We'll call, call them John and Jane. And let's say they have four children and let's say they have an estate worth $2 million. I told them it doesn't matter whether the estate is worth $200,000 or $20 million. We're going to use a nice round figure of $2 million because it's equal to do the math. I said the first thing that I'm going to do when somebody, when John and Jane come into my office or John and Jane do a Zoom call with me is I'm going to find out what, if anything, is most important to them. Are they trying to make things easy for each other? Are they trying to avoid probate? Do they want to leave things to their four children a certain way? Are their children minors? So are there all of those issues? Do they want to make uh, designate certain people to handle financial health care decisions for them if they're not able to handle things for themselves? John and Jane, what do you want to make sure we accomplish? And sometimes people say, well, we have this particular issue. And quite frankly, I told the group today, I said, I've been doing this for 31 years been waiting to find the first normal family, haven't found one yet because every family is unique and every family has their own unique circumstances that they want to address. So first thing I'm going to do with John and Jane, I'm going to find out if there's anything in particular that is really important to them that they want to accomplish. And then we'll make sure we address that throughout the process. But let's say John and Jane said, you know, Paul, we just, we haven't done anything. We don't even have a will. We just want to make sure our legal affairs are in order and everything's set up right. So I, chronologically, I'd start with, okay, John and Jane, let's talk not necessarily about what happens when you pass away, but what happens if during the rest of your lifetime, you're unable to sign your name, sell your house, sell your car, deal with your accounts, go get your medical records, talk to your doctors. Let's talk about making it easy for the people that you'd want to be able to do all of these, those things for you. So John and Jane, if they're like most couples, they will name their spouse as the first person that they'll name on their, and for financial purposes, it called, be, could be called power of attorney, general power of attorney, durable power of attorney. They'll likely name each other as their first, some people call it attorney. In fact, some people call it agent, I'll call it agent. John and Jane on their financial power of attorney will name their spouse as their first named agent. And then I'll tell them, you know what? Uh, if when you're incapacitated, your spouse isn't available to do things for you, who would you want that backup person to be? And they might designate one or more of their children, their adult children, as that alternate agent on their financial power of attorney. Then we'd go into the healthcare matters. Who do you want to be able to talk to your doctors if at some point during your lifetime you can't talk to your doctors and get your medical records for yourself? They'll likely name their spouse first, and again, maybe an adult child or children to serve as the backup to the spouse. We'd probably have a conversation about the living will or statement about life support machines because in America, you get the right to make your own medical decisions. And by signing a living will, most people look at that as they're relieving their loved ones from having to make that one difficult decision of removing life support if you're a vegetable with no chance of recovery. So when someone signs a living will, they'll sign a statement that says if I'm in that something to the effect that if I'm in that profound vegetative state, no chance of recovery, machines just artificially prolonging the dying process, I'm making my decision, directing my family and my doctors to honor my wishes, withhold or withdraw the life support machines, but provide me with enough medication to keep me comfortable. So that's the living will, we'd have that conversation. That gets them up to the what happens before you pass away. Now let's talk about when you pass away. Many married couples, they want to focus on what happens after both spouses pass away. I'd say, hold on. We first got to talk about what happens when one of you passes away. So I might say, you know what, John, you just told me you think you're going to die first. Most men do because you're a little older and you're a man. So let's talk about what happens, John, if you pass away first, but you know the same thing would happen, Jane, if you passed away first. You told me you had an estate of $2 million. Let's call that $1 million each. John, if you pass away, we know Jane's got her million. What do you want to do with your one million? Got a couple of options there. One, you can leave what's called ownership of, of your one million dollars to Jane. That way, Jane owns the whole two million dollars. It may even be prearranged so that when Jane later dies, it goes to the children. 
That first option is really easy to understand. I call it ownership to spouse. If John dies, Jane owns the whole kit and caboodle. Some people perceive that as that worries me because if John leaves everything to Jane and Jane either intentionally or unintentionally um, signs something in her later years, she could uh, exclude the children and the children never get a dime. You know, Jane could leave things to her next spouse. She could be influenced by someone to sign something totally excluding the children. So while leaving ownership entirely to the spouse is an easy option to understand, I said, John, you've got a second option. Again, you have your million, Jane has your million. So John, the second option is when you pass away, Jane still has her million, your million, John, goes into a trust. Maybe Jane could be the trustee and maybe Jane would be entitled to take distributions from that trust. And then when Jane dies, whatever's left in that trust that you left, John, automatically reverts back to your children. Jane can't redirect that trust to other people. So that gives John, your children, some protection after you pass away to make sure that they're gonna inherit your estate or what's left of it after Jane dies. Um, they'll, they'll have that protection to inherit that trust after Jane dies and then Jane can do whatever she wants to and leave her $1 million estate to whoever she wants to. So two options, John, leave ownership to spouse or leave your estate in trust for your spouse and that second option provides the children with some protection. Now let's talk John and Jane about what happens after both of you pass away. Lots of different options there. So uh, let's say John and Jane wanna treat their children generally equally. So we'd have conversations like, uh, John and Jane, let's say when both of you pass away, you have $2 million. Do you just want everything to go to the four children equally? So under that math, each child would get $500,000 and they can do whatever they want to with it. Some people are good with that. Some people, we take it a step further because let's say John and Jane have their son, Johnny. Johnny's been divorced a couple of times and he's about to get remarried. And you know what? John and Jane don't really like Johnny's future wife. So I might say to John and Jane, you know what? Let's talk about making your children's inheritance divorce proof or more divorce proof than just leaving it to them outright. John and Jane, how do you feel about leaving Johnny's inheritance or maybe even all of your children's inheritance, but I'm picking on Johnny right now. How do you feel about leaving Johnny's inheritance to what I call the Johnny Inheritance Trust? And after both of you pass away, Johnny can even be the trustee of his inheritance trust. But by leaving Johnny's inheritance to the inheritance trust, it prevents Johnny from mixing up his inheritance with other assets that he may have with his spouse. So that if he later gets divorced, he keeps his trust, Johnny and his spouse divide the other assets that they've acquired. So by leaving things to what I call that children's inheritance trust, you're, you're keeping things, uh, making it divorce proof for your children. Some parents like that. Other options for parents when they leave things to children, some parents are a little reluctant to just leave a lump sum to their children. So we talk about different types of uh, trust and trust distributions. If John, if John and Jane had minor children, we'd probably talk about naming a trustee as a trust for, for those minor children. And I'd say, John and Jane, your children are 17, 14, 12, and nine. At what point would you want them to be able to control their inheritance? Jane, you said you wanted your sister, Karen, to be able to manage all of it for them. But at what point would you want the children to be able to handle it for themselves? Knowing that Karen can make distributions to or for those children after John and Jane, you pass away. But at what point would you want the children to say, give me my inheritance, I'm entitled to it? Would, would you want them to get it at say age 25 or would you want them to get it in stages at 25, 30, and 35? Would you want Karen to have the discretion to determine when your children are ready to receive their inheritance? Would you want them to get a monthly amount until their inheritance runs out? Lots of different options there. Okay, so after we talk, and they could, uh, and, and if John and Jane were what I call a blended family, maybe John had two children, Jane had two children, and then they got married, probably makes that first, uh, that second option of when the first spouse dies, leaving things in trust even more important because if John leaves his estate entirely to Jane, Jane's likely to leave everything to her two children. So special issues there with blended families. Okay, the next thing I, would, I want uh, in my discussion with the credit union employees, other issues that come up, I talked about, well, let's say John and Jane are, are 70 years old and maybe they've accumulated three, four, five hundred thousand dollars of assets. There's a lot of people out there in that kind of range who are worried that if they go to a nursing home, they'll lose everything. 
So they have to get assets out of their name at least five years before they, before they go into a nursing home in order to make themselves more, themselves more Medicaid eligible. That's a separate kind of Medicaid eligibility planning issue. I talked to the credit union vice presidents about taxes and talked about how currently we have an estate tax exemption of a big number here, $12.06 million. And for married couples, they can really shield two times that or $24 million from the 40% federal estate tax. Now, that number is scheduled to be cut in half in 2026, so we'll see what happens then. So uh, and then, then they started asking me, can you, can you tell me what the process is for working with your office to get all of this done? I say it starts typically with a Zoom call. So uh, you would fill out an intake form. Maybe if you're watching this on a YouTube video, look in the description, you'll see a link. You fill out a form, uh, send that to us. We'll follow it up with an invitation to a calendar link where we can have a Zoom call. Uh, no, there's no expense in, in having that Zoom call, but we talk through all those things that we just talked about. If everything's ready to go, then we'll gather information. We'll prepare all the legal documents, trusts, wills, powers of attorney, etc. Send all that to you, review things with you, make sure it's perfect, and then work on making it official by getting everything signed properly. I also talked to the credit union about how there's two ways to do all of this. You can do it through what's called a will plan or you can do it through a trust plan. Let's talk about the will plan for a moment. So John and Jane may have a will plan where they leave everything in their names. They structure their wills and structure how they want to leave things to each other and then to their children and who that executor will be when they pass away. The downside of doing all of this through your wills is when each spouse dies, assets are going to be frozen and a probate proceeding will be required and your survivors will have to hire lawyers like myself to walk them through that court and attorney involved probate process. Many people perceive that as being very expensive and taking a long time. It's always thousands of dollars and it's always months to years in length. So the other option, which many people employ, is John and Jane could, could go with option number two. Instead of having a will-based plan where they have their wills and powers of attorney and healthcare documents, instead of that, they could create a trust-based plan where they have the John and Jane Doe Living Trust with John and Jane as the trustees. The trust says while both of them are alive, they can do whatever they want to with all of the trust assets. The trust says when one of them dies, the surviving spouse stays in control after both of them die then uh, the trustee, maybe Johnny Jr., would be in charge of distributing the assets to the four children in accordance with all of the trust instruments. The benefit of having the John and Jane Living Trust and having their home and investment accounts and other what we call probate assets retitled from John and Jane, during Jan John and Jane's lifetime, from John and Jane to John and Jane as trustees of the John and Jane Living Trust is that when John and Jane each pass away, there's no probate. Things that, things that are titled in the name of your living trust, they don't have to go through that probate, when you, probate process when you pass away. When John dies, Jane just doesn't have to do anything. Then when Jane later dies, the next day Johnny can start settling the estate outside of any court and attorney involved probate. I told them, I told the credit union audience that the expenses, expenses involved in that when someone creates that will-based plan, it's about a $1,950 expense to set up the whole plan for the married couple, that trust-based plan, about $4,500. Uh, there could be additional expenses or would be additional expenses if real, if real estate gets transferred to that trust, but that living trust plan, again, eliminates those two probates, one when each of John and Jane passes away. You could talk to five different lawyers and get five different answers about legal fees. I'm just giving you an example. So that was the extent of my conversation with the credit union vice presidents today. Boy, they were, uh, they had a lot of questions and it went really well. And some of them have already you know, inquired about getting me to help them and how do they get started with that initial Zoom call. If you'd like, wherever you live in the country, if you'd like to initiate a discussion about that, just see the link at the top of the description below. That'll get you started. Make sure you like and subscribe. Have a great day.